we go to the paper presentation section. We have uh, three presentations at the Stella della Garza, but uh, unfortunately, Professor della Garza could not come to the conference, but uh, she sent a great video for a presentation, so we'll be, we'll be projected. And then uh, we have uh, uh, Joanna Boxia that could not join us today, but Professor Zibinier Boxia will make her presentation. And then the last but not least, as usual, uh, um, we have uh, Agile Education for Turbulent Times by Grazina Lesniak-Boska. Uh, uh, she is professor in the Management Institute of Arsa School of Economics PhD, uh, with PhD received in 2011. Head of the Varsa Executive MBA program with the University of Minnesota. Uh, over 30 years of experience in post-diploma management equation, member of the Global Executive Learning Network, Associated Member of the World Academy of Art and Science. Project on strategy, operation, project management, investment risk in Central and Western Europe countries, in sustainable development, corporate social responsibility and trust. Teaching corporate social responsibility, strategy management, operation management, project management, and enterprise value building role. Author of over 100 publications. So. We start with the video first, and then uh, Professor Zibian Bosnia, and then uh, uh, Gazina Lesnik. Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Yo soy la maestra Estela de la Garza Flores, del Tecnológico de Monterrey. Nos encontramos en Monterrey, Nuevo León, México. Muy contenta y muy agradecida de poder participar en este tercer Congreso Internacional del Futuro de la Educación en Río de Janeiro, Brasil. La ponencia que yo les voy ahorita a, a comentar, su título es Microaprendizaje Digital, Menos es Más. Quiero comentarles cuál es el objetivo. Miren, el microaprendizaje es una metodología que da una solución al eh, aprendizaje que estamos ahorita viviendo con las nuevas generaciones de los alumnos, la generación Z, los milenios, pero también nosotros mismos. Vivimos en un mundo de la rapidez, de la mensajería instantánea, donde que no queremos perder el tiempo en nada. El microaprendizaje es una perspectiva del aprendizaje que está orientada a la granulación de contenidos, pero esta granulación está hecha por microcontenidos digitales. ¿Cuál es la característica de ese microcontenido digital? Es que por sí mismo es una capsulita, es un recurso digital que tiene un inicio y fin y que el alumno, el participante, nosotros mismos podemos ir aprendiendo en un lapso de tiempo corto. De eso se va a tratar ahorita la ponencia de cómo lo valioso que es el microaprendizaje eh, en estos eh, tiempos que estamos viviendo y cómo la tecnología, cómo lo digital nos ha ayudado a poderlo aplicar en muchos ámbitos educativos. Sí, muchos, hay muchos estudios que se han hecho de, 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 de generación Z, pero también muchas investigaciones en las universidades y en las instituciones que se encargan, empresas que se encargan en capacitación. También las empresas en su capacitación se han eh, puesto a ver, a hacer un gran cambio en la forma que están aprendiendo sus empleados, donde quieren información muy puntual, muy relevante, muy concisa, donde puedan aprender y no dedicarle mucho tiempo a contenidos largos, largos, donde el aprendizaje está inmerso en todo ese mundo de información. Los microcontenidos, para poder este, ayudarnos, esos microcontenidos, hay que irlos armando para que generen una secuencia didáctica. Entonces, esa secuencia didáctica va a generar al mismo tiempo una ruta de aprendizaje que se va a ir personalizando. ¿Por qué? Porque el alumno, el participante, va a ir eligiendo cada uno de esos recursos que tiene que ir aprendiendo según su estilo de aprendizaje y su, según su interés. Entonces, esto lo va a hacer más valioso y, en cierto modo, hasta más divertido. ¿Sí? La ruta de aprendizaje crea una secuencia didáctica, una secuencia didáctica donde está uniendo todos estos recursos didácticos, todos estos microcontenidos para generar un microaprendizaje en un corto tiempo. La estrategia de aprendizaje 
está orientada a micros contenidos y el alumno tiene la oportunidad de decidir cuáles son los temas de interés, porque también le da la oportunidad de empezar a investigar y estar navegando en otros temas de interés, cada alumno va a estar investigando. Aparte, a todos nos pasa que estamos estudiando, que estamos navegando en la red y a la media hora, por nuestro interés, acabamos estudiando otros contenidos que también los podemos aplicar en nuestro trabajo, en nuestros intereses personales. ¿Por qué es flexible este aprendizaje, este microaprendizaje es flexible? Porque me da la oportunidad, porque es digital, de que yo decido qué estudiar, cómo y en dónde. Me da oportunidad a lo mejor de oír un podcast cuando voy manejando, de ver un video, de una lectura rápida cuando estoy esperando subirme al avión. Me da la oportunidad de estar aprendiendo en un corto lapso de tiempo con temas de mi interés. ¿Sí? En el TEC desarrollamos una plataforma digital, ¿verdad?, donde iba a estar eh, con un gran repositorio que iba a tener una serie de recursos didácticos digitales, ¿verdad?, que pudieran ser eh, un Word, un PowerPoint, un Prezi, un video, un audio, pero ¿cuáles eran las características principales de estos recursos digitales? Deberían de estar con un contexto actual, aplicable, que fuera significativo para el alumno, que le diera cómo poderlo aplicar en su ambiente laboral, cómo eh, poderlo eh, aplicar en sus proyectos de cada día y que fuera analítico y conciso. Eh, todos estos eh, recursos, siempre cuando se iban a estar armando los recursos, acuérdense que son capsulitas de micro contenido, iban a ir a generar una ruta de aprendizaje. El maestro genera una ruta de aprendizaje predeterminada y el alumno va generando rutas personalizadas para él mismo. De tal forma que el estudiante, no sé, Esteban, va a tener una ruta de aprendizaje diferente a la ruta de aprendizaje de María, pero todos logrando el mismo objetivo de aprendizaje, pues del curso en general. ¿Qué se hizo? Para poder generar todos estos recursos, se, hizo, se generaron dos partes, los recursos creados y los recursos curados. Los recursos creados son los que los expertos, los de que los profesores que son expertos en su tema se pusieron a desarrollar, desarrollarlo en formato digital, un PDF, un Word, un ejercicio, un Excel, eh, un video, un audio de diferentes formatos, ¿verdad?, para poder ellos con su expertise darle valioso a nuestros alumnos del TEC de Monterrey. Otros son los recursos curados. ¿Por qué la palabra curada? Ustedes recordarán que existen en las obras de arte los curadores. Cuando vamos a los museos, a una exposición, vemos toda la serie de cuadros armados en un, eh, eh, en un espacio, pero no fueron puestos al azar. Cuentan una historia, cuentan una relación, el artista te va transmitiendo eso. El curador, junto con el artista, hace esa secuencia. Por eso se llaman recursos curados, porque el maestro, el experto, entra a la red, navega, busca en las eh, bases de datos, en las páginas web de, eh, que ella tiene validados para seleccionar esos recursos que se los da a recomendar a sus alumnos. Por eso es el término de recursos curados. No quiere decir que todos van a ser creados. Hay infinidad de recursos en la red que son valiosos. Ahora, muchos de estos, aquí viene un, un, un eh, formato, ¿verdad? Después ustedes van a tener oportunidad de este PowerPoint, tenerlo este, en sus manos. Hay mucha información, eh, multimedia, páginas web, este, infografías, una serie de infografías muy valiosas. Lo que es muy importante, que todos estos recursos sean actualizados verdad, este, sean confiables, sean relevantes y que sean interés para eh, los objetivos de aprendizaje que queremos en el alumno. Ese es el gran reto de los recursos curados. ¿Cómo le hago para, lo, para general? ¿Cuál es el proceso para la curación de recursos digitales? Primero entro a la red, busco cuáles son los, los eh, recursos valiosos, los este, eh, relevantes que necesitamos, eh, algo muy importante, 
como profesor tiene que generar una aportación. ¿Cuál es esa aportación? Es un comentario, no es un abstract, no es algo que diga, este recurso se trata de esto, sino al contrario, te va a decir por qué es valioso. Fíjate en tal parte, en tal tema, en tal párrafo, en tal minuto. Esa es la aportación, es lo que hace valioso a ese recurso curado de los otros recursos que están en la red, que ningún experto me va a decir en dónde me tengo que fijar. Luego, es importante asignar los metadatos. ¿Qué son los metadatos? Recordemos que estos recursos digitales están en un repositorio y yo siempre pongo la analogía que son como pelotitas de ping-pong. Si tenemos estas pelotitas de ping-pong sueltas, pues entraría y estarían todas volando, ¿verdad? Todas, eh, sería como una alberca llena de pelotitas, pero tienen que estar re relacionados unos con otros, con los metadatos, de tal forma que un recurso digital pueda ser relacionado con otro recurso digital y genere mi ruta de aprendizaje. ¿Qué va a hacer esto? Los metadatos. También, otra de las cosas valiosas que no debemos de olvidar, que todos estos recursos digitales pueden ser utilizados en muchos cursos. Si yo estoy dando del área de mercadotecnia, puede ser del curso de principios de mercadotecnia, puede ser el curso de análisis de mercado, puede ser este, del curso de análisis del consumidor, pueden ser utilizados, son reutilizados estos recursos. Como cada uno es un ente, pues lo puedo utilizar en diferentes aprendizajes. La, la creación de recursos digitales es muy parecida, tiene el mismo proceso, la diferencia es que el maestro lo va a generar, va a generar, hay muchas herramientas en internet donde podemos aplicar eh, aplicaciones, Canva, hay muchas eh, aplicaciones donde yo puedo grabar videos, hacer mis presentaciones y que puedo hacerle un formato digital a los recursos que son creados por el maestro. Igual tiene que hacer su aportación, que es muy valiosa, y generar los metadatos para estos cursos creados por el profesor. Recordemos, vamos a tener el repositorio lleno de todos los recursos eh, creados y curados todos ligados para generar las rutas de aprendizaje predeterminadas y después personalizadas para el alumno. ¿Qué podemos concluir en toda esta investigación? Podemos concluir que el microaprendizaje es una perspectiva de aprendizaje orientada a la granulación de contenidos generados por recursos didácticos digitales. Recordemos, pueden ser creados, pueden ser curados, siempre que sean confiables, relevantes, que generen un aprendizaje significativo para mi alumno y que estén actualizados. Es muy importante que sean integrados, que tengan un inicio, un fin y que no estén así como sueltos, ¿verdad? Que yo los pueda relacionar para generar una ruta de aprendizaje que no pudiera lograrse solamente con el estudio de un recurso. Otro de los puntos valiosos es que ayuda al aprendizaje personalizado del alumno. Es un aprendizaje flexible donde el alumno aprende, eh, puede estudiar en el lugar que le plazca, cuando decida y en los formatos diferentes según su estilo de aprendizaje. Esta es mi participación en este en esta conferencia. Muchas gracias. Quiero aquí dejarles mis datos. Viene mi correo, Estela estela bajo de la garza arroba .mx. con todo gusto escríbanme pueden escribirme en inglés, en español y con todo gusto yo les voy a contestar, muchas gracias a todos por su atención y pues seguimos en contacto now I call on the floor uh, uh, speak near uh, Bosnia, profesor And, and, and both of them. Yeah, if they, ladies first, which you. Grazina. Grazina. Okay, so you decide <laughs> which, which. Grazina, the floor is yours. Speak is a gentleman, so that's why I'm going first. 
My perception is a little bit different because we have heard a lot of uh, fantastic uh, uh, speeches about uh, high science, about so many disciplines uh, that evolved uh, to the top levels of knowledge and understanding of normal people. And um, I'm teaching management and I represent the business school. So uh, my level of abstraction is a little bit lower. <laughs> and uh, my major focus is uh, how to make all those uh, complicated and advanced uh, disciplines of knowledge closer to the users who are learning, uh, who will be working in business and have to understand how to make all those things happen for the benefits of the societies they represent and the companies uh, they are employed uh, by. So uh, the title of my presentation is Agile Education for Turbulent Times. So I am not expected, I hope, to explain what the turbulent times are because all those expressions were already used here. And uh, Agile was also used, uh, although in management science it's, uh, it's usually attracted to some methods of uh, project management. Uh, but actually, uh, it's being, uh, uh, its understanding and application is being extended to the use of any sort of activities. It uh, could be agile organizations, agile processes. It means that uh, you have to be always uh, focused uh, on, on, the, on the topic uh, you want to progress uh, in. And uh, regardless of the constraints, uh, uh, you have to uh, manage uh, those matters and to bring to the, the success uh, results. Um, well, let's start with a very brutal truth. That is a perception, uh, the social perception of, on what is really going on. Uh, first of all, uh, we observe the revolution for zero. Again, I'm not going to repeat uh, everything on revolution for zero, but uh, the contemporary education for employability, so it means the ability to be employed, uh, correspond with the change of the global business landscape. It's not only the science, uh, it's uh, mainly the business landscape that is a contingency uh, for employment and contingency for producing wealth and, and, and so on. Uh, Business world uh, is characterized by the competitive rules that have been set up and uh, they have a certain inertia. So we cannot just overcome them. The, the world is not empty. There, there are always forces uh, who govern <laughs> in the, on the business landscape and we have to, to stick to them or to understand them and eventually to overcome some of those uh, constraints. Uh, what has been noticed a uh, long, long time ago, it means uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the, the second millennium uh, in uh, INSEAD, uh, it's uh, Rita Madgrath, but also, also other uh, researchers, that uh, in business there is nothing stable nowadays and permanently we have uh, uh, to do with the transient character of competitive advantages. There is no space for everybody. There is a space only for leaders. Others are laggards and uh, they unfortunately will not win on the marketplace. So uh, how to deal with the transit competitive advantages and permanently shortening business cycles, product cycles, uh, industry cycles, uh, because uh, it means uh, that uh, for investors, <coughs> uh, if you invest, you cannot have time for cashing out all your investments. So it's expensive but the results are uncertain. So uh, again, we have to deal with this uh, logic of uh, financial world. And um, again, if we are looking at the technology, the technology uh, itself only um, means costs and the promise that something will be changed for the better. But the profits and benefits are in the society and they are on the market. So that is a platform for exchanging uh, you know, for goods for, uh, for money. And um, <clears throat> there is uh, time uh, to strategic design of the future. So we, we have to think in terms of strategy rather, uh, how the organization should look like in the future and how to make the smart use of smart technology. Because technology may be smart, but the society may be totally lost and not profiting from its uh, full potential. 
Um, in the anatomy of uh, transient advantages, so those short-term gains, uh, gains that we could uh, eventually have, is based, um, as it was pointed out in one of the presentations, on the decent evaluation of risks and operational excellence following every good idea. Uh, I've, been, I've been teaching for years the strategy courses yeah, at the executive MBA programs, but also on master programs. But after some time, I s simply uh, realized that uh, the uh, strategy itself is empty if it's not followed by disciplined execution. So the execution brings results. Then, uh, actually, I'm teaching uh, operations management and project management. Uh, so, process management, process improvement, uh, project type of uh, organizing activities, all forms and combinations of those two forms uh, to make things uh, happen. And um, in every organization, there is a big problem, um, first of all, to generating initiatives and then to executing them, but uh, there is a certain order required. What are the priorities in front of uh, uh, the needs and the constraints uh, that we encounter. So every company uh, from the management point of view has to create or design a sort of pipeline. What will be first, well, what will be next, what resources to, should be prepared or generated uh, to start some, some initiatives and this is the, the management uh, process and, and ordering. However, if we look at the technology, first of all, we have to understand the social impacts and social understanding and, and society being prepared or not prepared to uh, acquire the new uh, inventions um, and the new sometimes genius uh, uh, um, uh, ideas. Uh, from the point of view of the economy, there is a strong perception about the market pressure. Everybody understands those competitive pressures and how the market uh, creates the pressures on manufacturing companies and what is the expectation? That you always have to be close to your customer. You have to create value to your customer. But the customer does not want to pay a lot. So it's uh, close to zero <laughs> price for something that is really creating value. So just uh, try to make the gem in your brains uh, how to put those uh, two ends together. It's really a, a, a mystery how many companies due to scalability and very intelligent designs uh, uh, are still able to, to deliver basing on this uh, competitive uh, premises. Uh, there is also the, the harsh digital race in investments but if you are a little bit too late, then there are zero returns. So who will pay for that? Who will lose for that? Who are the, the, the shareholders of such initiatives and uh, uh, how um, the companies can build trust if they are too, a little bit too late to catch this train of progress? So the question is, uh, where, where is the money <laughs> in all these processes? Uh, how to cash out all those initiatives? And uh, there are, of course, some other concepts. Do we still need money? Perhaps uh, there will be something uh, better than money. Money is very universal metrics of, of success, of cost, of progress. So it's, it's very good. But uh, there are also concepts of sharing economy. But you don't need money, you are just, you are just exchanging uh, favors, services, products, everybody contributes. As, so, quite utopian concepts, but in small societies, uh, they, they used to work. But uh, more difficult are social concerns that the technology will replace people, so there will be no employment uh, uh, for people. And uh, if you take the statistical metrics, uh, the population is not consisting only from geniuses and uh, hardworking people and capable of change and, and, and so on. It's, it's a statistical spread of talent, statistical spread of uh, um, effectiveness and, and so on. Uh, so, uh, if the unemployment uh, uh, is going to raise, uh, it will lead uh, eventually to poverty and social exclusion of these people. What will be the consequences of social unrest? On the economy, on technology development, on creating uh, the GDP growth, and there is another um, uh, s s nice phenomenon that I like, it's a new type of economy and it's called economics of happiness. And according to this uh, economics of happiness, I'm the closer to Neantra's presentation of leisure, <laughs> leisure, happiness, something that is not a business uh, type of uh, uh, 
category, but, but it works. So according to some, some research, and I refer it uh, actually to the Polish landscape, that about 18% of actively engaged uh, people, uh, uh, there is 18% of people who are actively engaged in this process, uh, about the same of actively disengaged people who never apply for a job, uh, apply for a job. They are not interested. Somebody else works for them, so uh, uh, even if they, they are educated, they, they don't want to work. What about the rest? They are working, but they are very unhappy. They are doing the job they hate. So uh, perhaps uh, this is also a sort of deviation uh, in terms of how to organize our, our life. Artificial intelligence is absolutely you know, <laughs> moving us uh, to, to think deeper. And um, of course, it's not a new phenomenon. It, uh, the, the term has been coined in uh, 1956, so uh, the cons famous conference in, in Dartmouth. But uh, the, the, fully, um, the, the first uh, really uh, important applications uh, were not uh, even reaching the, the, the tani, ten, 10 years. And uh, I don't want uh, to explain you know, the whole uh, genesis and construction of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, but what we observe, there is a permanent development from the technology point of view and uh, from the possible um, use uh, that uh, the society can profit from uh, of AI waves. Uh, they, have, uh, uh, they are being developed uh, simultaneously, however, with different pace and with different uh, uh, interactions among uh, one of them. So I think that it wasn't mentioned yet. So the, the first wave of um, uh, AI is internet AI. So in, in many companies we already have it in, in all the countries I think that know it that uh, uh, all the data that is uh, available by internet so in the digital form could be labeled. If it's uh, labeled uh, uh, then it could be profiled and many companies already have started um, uh, to uh, day for data profiling uh, they sell the data that they come uh, they uh, gather on the on the platforms uh, and uh, the rise of such companies is absolutely amazing. One of the, such a companies is a cloud technologies company. Uh, it's a company set up by uh, uh, our school graduate, 33 years old uh, young man. He employs uh, 55 uh, people and uh, the company is one of the five global leading companies in data profiling. So they query raw materials from the digital space, from all the computers, uh, handsets, wherever the signal is uh, in the digital form, they can uh, query it and then uh, they, uh, through using the big data and machine learning um, and neurosciences, deep learning, they uh, create profiles that they sell to uh, advertising companies. And they totally change the, the, the business landscape because uh, uh, if we ask them, who is your competitor? And they say, well, it's, it's really difficult uh, to tell because uh, uh, all these uh, five uh, leading companies uh, in the world are exchanging uh, information. So uh, if the cloud technology is using the information that has been gathered by another one, they, uh, at the end, uh, they make a clearing of in megabytes, not in dollars, not in any money <laughs> issue, but in megabytes megabytes and then the rest will be uh, will be monetized so our students are extremely interested how to set up such a company how to be successful the, the only deficiency is that uh, there may be just a few companies of this of, of this type uh, they are fast cre fastly created but there is no more space the platform is so uh, it has such a large capacity that uh, that they could grow uh, using their own resources not too many space for, for others uh, the second um, wave uh, is uh, business um, artificial intelligence that collects data on facts processes and allows for decision making and super deep diagnostics in such uh, areas like like banking, like like medicine. So when you have to put together the big uh, uh, sets of data that the human brain can hardly digest and then see uh, and see the clear picture. And then, so the next uh, wave is uh, the perception, uh, artificial intelligence. So there are thousands, even millions of sensors and devices used in uh, simple city and uh, home applications. And uh, it is called the trillion sensor economy. Um, it's used for speech interfaces, for super smart assistants. You know, we are 
uh, especially the aging population may have problems with memory and the super assistant that is a technology a solution uh, will help you uh, to reminding you what is important and uh, collecting data and uh, and uh, trying to help you in any, any situation there are also computer vision applications so like uh, quality inspections in the company so it's, it's, it's very important very precise and detailed uh, quality inspections in the fourth wave uh, that is uh, actually in, uh, being developed is autonomous uh, AI is integrating all previously mentioned ones and it's uh, sensing, responding and uh, making decisions but also manipulating so it will be much more intelligent that we uh, can, can expect from the machine and it is, uh, it, 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 it is already used and it may be used in automated assembly line and warehouses and together with all type of, uh, of robotics. Uh, there are three major uh, improvements expected to bring uh, t a trillion uh, of um, dollars uh, worldwide GDP in 2030. And uh, those uh, benefits that, that are expected or ways that we will use uh, those technologies uh, uh, could be just put into two sets. First, that you can automate transactions, both physical transactions and the cognitive transactions. And the second group, uh, the second set, uh, is uh, augmenting our innovative uh, capabilities and also leadership capabilities. So it's uh, support of, uh, of those, uh, those two. Um, in automations, for instance, there is an automation of, of management data query, data analytics, AI used to optimize activity, to optimize processes, uh, to optimize the whole businesses, and also automation of operations so that it refers to robotics, to IoT, to 3D printing, analytics, uh, and uh, it's used to automate and automize operations, so it could be done any, anywhere. Augmentation means uh, something that is, goes beyond uh, the normal uh, skills, okay, thank you. And um, automated leadership, it means that technology uh, augments uh, unique human qualities uh, to shape the future of business, of process, and, and so on. It's also fortifying our creative uh, processes and uh, design thinking with the use of uh, insights, uh, with the use of uh, CAD CAM technologies and also uh, simulations. So this automation and augmentation uh, help us to understand what could be the potential benefits and how to explain them to people who are afraid of, because we cannot just oscillate between hope and fear. Uh, we should be pragmatic and uh, to make the, uh, the use. Uh, how to make it happen? Um, it means that uh, there is uh, the time when the company had a one strategy is over. Uh, it should be the permanent uh, uh, continuous formulation and undertaking of strategic or operational uh, initiatives to build and use numerous transient advantages because you never know how long it will last uh, so you should be prepared for uh, with, with abundance of, of such initiatives. And um, the position of the companies will depend from the evolving portfolios of, uh, of uh, initiatives and advantages that assure the continuity of existence and eventually winning on the marketplace on one of the leadership positions that uh, um, continue your work. And thus uh, uh, the strategy becomes a fuzzy uh, phenomenon and not uh, something uh, tough and uh, it, the strategy will be customer and opportunity focused so it's not the certainty that you will win and certainty what you should do uh, so uh, this uh, disruption also uh, erodes uh, the industry's uh, um, uh, definitions and the traditional industries are being disrupted too, so, so are the, the products uh, they used to, pr to, pr to manufacture before. And the decision making system should be prepared uh, for the very fast actions, not just decision but also putting the decisions um, uh, into action and the delayed decision and delayed actions have completely no business sense and this is a, no, a new strategic normality. Possible traps, first mover advantage, not necessarily, sometimes uh, you get trapped because it's not a good idea, so you have always to be prepared with some exit strategies. Some companies uh, used to think that they are always the best. Something, uh, some companies think that only the top quality matters. No, sometimes it's uh, not needed. It costs too much. 
uh, something cheaper of lower quality will do, will do the job much, much better. Uh, there are some also thinking about no available resources or something that they are wise spots that the idea is excellent, but it does not fit to our speciality. So it's just an idea. It's uh, um, abandoned. Uh, some companies are rather focused on building empires than on doing business and satisfying client, client needs and sporadic innovation. So they are the uh, new rules um, the, of the game. So we have to first of all focus on building value. Uh, think in terms of domains, not industries, uh, uh, set up the issue and uh, allow for experimentation because there is no certainty. Um, we have also to set up new measures of uh, evaluation, especially of uncertain uh, um, actions. And uh, experiences should be used uh, problem solving and not imitation of somebody else's uh, uh, solutions. Uh, very important is building relationships and networks. Uh, and it's not recommended to, to, uh, to forget about innovating and from time to time to undergo radical restructuring of everything because it means a, a big uh, hole in. Uh, in, in revenues. So we have to learn soft, healthy exit strategies from the ideas that become obsolete and you know, in a timely manner. And uh, what is also important is a systematic engagement in the early stage of innovations when you already have the feeling that this, this is your field. We have to experiment, learn, and make the next uh, step. Uh, if I may just give you one example, how I'm, how I'm teaching students uh, the operations management course. Uh, they are international students, and the textbooks on operations management are as thick as that. Uh, I have learned that they do not uh, read them, they do not learn from them, uh, so I switched, uh, totally switched the roles. And uh, if there is a syllabus with topics uh, from uh, uh, covering all the important uh, issues uh, within the operations management pile, they have to create teams and to teach all others what they have discovered, but not using the old uh, and obsolete textbooks, but digging into internet, into articles that they usually omit, <laughs> they, they don't uh, uh, read the uh, uh, business journals. And they have to find the, uh, the best uh, practices, uh, best practicing uh, enterprise in this respect, like, like for instance, flexibility management or new product development or location or, or whatever. And the one that is a big, big failure. Sometimes it was a famous company who failed because it was uh, not designed properly. I have learned that uh, uh, our students, uh, it's not only Polish students, they are international students really from all over the world. Uh, they are lacking curiosity. They are not digging deep into the material. Uh, they are not too much interested uh, with uh, uh, upgrading their knowledge if they do not see the sense, practical sense for them, and they do not know how to work in teams. So uh, when you uh, sh share the responsibility for, for, for the presentation, uh, they, they also other students are ask for feedback, and they give the points for them. And they also evaluate their own conduct within, within the team. And uh, then, um, this uh, responsibility makes them really uh, dig uh, uh, deeper and harder and try to show up in front of the whole group. Uh, of course, it does not uh, replace the good textbooks, but, but the textbooks nowadays always become obsolete. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rosita. I think we will take uh, questions at the end of the, of the presentation, so mm -hmm. I invite uh, Professor Zbigny Bothner to give uh, his presentation titled Making the Education Better uh, Responding to the Changing Labor Market. The floor is here. I can use this line, I guess it's. It works, you can. Okay, I will try to be short and then uh, focus on very practical uh, issues. Why do we are wasting the most valuable resources such as uh, uh, young people? Opportunities to educate and work to support themselves. So it's our joint presentation with my daughter, who couldn't come, she's the 
director of the Center for Innovative uh, Education. And I participated in uh, several of her events. So, major uh, issues, diagnosis of the problem, and then introduction of the new European Education Forum. And uh, the model, we were talking about the Latin uh, and American perspective. We would like to share what we are doing in Europe, uh, how to deal, how to resolve the issue of uh, youth unemployment. So when we look at the, uh, the situation, we talk today many times, we need to have an innova uh, innovative approach. So these are the examples uh, of innovative approaches. And then we saw today an example. I mean, the, the, uh, Netflix is the major movie uh, distributor without any uh, movie theaters. And uh, you can go further, Amazon, uh, Uber, Air, uh, BNB, I state in uh, Mexico, you know, they don't have any real estate. So today, uh, our uh, colleague, uh, uh, from Olivier from France showed that you can educate very effectively uh, without uh, educational traditional academia or institutions. Very useful skills without professors, without grading, without textbooks. So we should think about and we are in the process of building type of graduate program interdisciplinary, which is really type of breakthrough. Uh, how to deliver in, in very innovative ways. So I think that this conference is also very inspiring for us. So the, the previous school and now, I mean, we could teach, educate without uh, children, <laughs> uh, without classes. So uh, what, what is depressing, this is why I'm particularly interested and in my daughter who is educated lawyer after uh, 15 years of uh, hard work in American law firm in Warsaw and in Europe uh, uh, switched to uh, non-governmental uh, activities so it's burned down with the business uh, uh, legal business particularly and started saving horses and then she switched to saving children children particularly from rural areas who are not prepared to job, who are, uh, um, not utilizing their potentials. So the European survey uh, showed that 62% uh, percent, uh, um, employees completed, uh, I mean, education and graduated from the uh, secondary or, uh, schools. Usually this is focused on the secondary schools. Uh, high schools uh, uh, do not have work uh, based experience. They are not unprepared as a work. Uh, then uh, uh, 42 uh, employees uh, are mismatching their skills in uh, classification. What is, you know, 27% uh, of employees uh, is in dead end jobs. And this is what is most depressing. 20% of European youth are unemployed. And this is something what is a problem, is causing the problem for the future. Uh, uh, we did in, in, uh, in Poland the research, and then uh, uh, a center of, for innovative education, 29, only 29 schools, only 29 schools, Students indicated they have the teacher who, with whom they could speak about future. And then 60% uh, uh, of parents uh, are telling that schools are not prepared uh, for their kids for adulthood, for their responsibilities. 71% of schools mostly concentrate on uh, tests inspecting formally recognized student knowledge and competencies, but not preparation for the uh, uh, real life. And this is, this is the problem. This is why uh, uh, the uh, European uh, New Education Forum was established at the European Parliament and the uh, uh, Center for Innovative 
organization is one of the organizations belonging to this platform that are exchanging good practices. So, uh, there are supporting independent learning programs, for innovative uh, uh, learning strategies, uh, education uh, quality, working with all stakeholders, particularly with teachers, school principals, with uh, employers, and they are following the uh, changes in the labor market. But they are getting also students and the parents uh, involved. So uh, they have already collected about 30 good practices from several of these countries, starting with Austria uh, to Spain. And uh, so far, I mean, these are the activities coordinated by the uh, Center of Innovative, uh, Innovative uh, uh, Education. They had six regional forums and two annual forums at the European Parliament with uh, a presence of uh, commissioners and uh, parliament members. I uh, attended the previous one. And then uh, they prepared charters recommendations from each workshop, from each uh, uh, larger forum. There are some documents uh, which are shared all over Europe, again, in the sustainable development, active citizenship and inclusion, development and potential, vocational learning and training, uh, updating skills and getting involved all stakeholders. The working model of NEF is like presenting good practices. As I mentioned, 30 good practices are already corrected. And uh, they are going through an uh, international evaluation by experts. And then uh, there are, uh, there's a process of engagement of stakeholders and European Parliament members, you know, they discuss how to support these uh, initiatives. And there are, there's a process of fundraising to support this and disseminate uh, within the European Union. Uh, a few, uh, this is an example of, of the, this case is Polish mentor program. Uh, the goal to change paradigm shift from teacher uh, center <laughs> role we will use, I will use my language, from student transmitter knowledge to student's mentor to student uh, facilitator. Developing motivation, discovering talents. And uh, I mean, this, this, maybe it was a personal story uh, of my daughter in Poland. She, she was a pretty good student, but uh, she came to the States, 85, with a syndrome that she doesn't have any talents in mathematics. An American uh, teacher in the public school in Minnesota helped her to discover that she has great abilities in mathematics. She was one of the best students in mathematics. Different approach. And an approach of a good uh, school, you know, to show what talent students have and build on success, their the confidence. And uh, uh, <clears throat> so they are working on the labor market, and team building schools, supporter of students' development, uh, and developing uh, modern tools in education, including games uh, and so on. I participated in these few uh, workshops and I was really impressed with both the commitments of the teachers that were coming, paying for themselves to this workshop and the quality of facilitators who are really, you know, I mean, they were Poles but educated at the best European uh, institutions. This is really, and uh, some impacts are uh, coming from the village, the Viti, the guy from the school, I mean, the, I don't remember, was 14 years old, was 13, won the NASA uh, uh, com global competition, how to resolve problem uh, on, uh, on Mars, uh, collection uh, data. So, somehow, I mean, this is an example that good teachers could help. Uh, this is another excellent example, which really, this is the Flemish community in Belgium, welcoming refugees through education. And then, I mean, to respond to the crisis, we know exactly 
What is the, the major issue, and this is something what uh, confirms Liora and Ernesto uh, uh, um, presentations. The key issue was develop linguistic abilities of these refugees. And I, I know, I mean, from my own experience when we came to the States 85, kids got exactly enrolled in English as a second language. Every, every morning, two hours before, and within one year they were completely bilingual and integrated with the rest community, including sleeping over parties and so on. So language, I mean communication, is the key. And so there are some extra details, you know, uh, uh, support for uh, building uh, uh, the tutors in the schools and so on. And this is the original, I mean, I'm using the original slides of, of this uh, uh, Belgian organization you have here address. And another, I mean, the Scots uh, are genial in terms of uh, sustainable development education. They have the most develop sophisticated system with certification uh, at each level from kindergarten to uh, universities. So what they do, they start I mean, bringing kids to Aldo to see the nature. And uh, what they did, uh, uh, they developed the program which uh, she built, her foundation built the uh, um, training program from outdoors to labor market. Uh, this is a, a, a project that are running now and uh, <clears throat> with eight partners, two from each uh, of the beneficiary countries, to Poland, Ireland and Spain are the beneficiaries of this program, but they have expert mostly from Scotland. And with the last 42 months, and uh, should take into account 900, almost 1,000 so-called needs. So, young people not, in, uh, uh, not employed, without education and training. And they use the Scottish methods. Uh, they start with 30 uh, person group in each of these three countries, and they go outdoor. After three days, they say two, three days is enough to convince them that education is important for them. And they would like to uh, get education and work. How they are doing, I didn't <laughs> participate in this, but they, they started practicing now, and then when this, and then the, the Polish, uh, Spanish, uh, Irish teachers are observing uh, this process, and then they will uh, move from the 30 uh, group to 300 each uh, country within this is uh, 42 months. So they will be disseminated in all over Europe. Yeah, I finish it. So anyway, uh, there is a, a forum. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot attend because we have Dubrovnik meeting, but uh, you could look at the address and you can attend this uh, conference uh, in Brussels on 22nd of November. It's free of charge. Okay, so this is the program I wanted to uh, present because this, uh, this is the program which is dealing with the most urgent issue. To give the chance of the young generation, unemployed, without uh, education, without training, uh, without hope in better life. So anyway, as Gary mentioned in the first uh, presentation. Education creates hope for people. And this is what this project is about. Thank you very much for attention. And we stay to the end of the conference. Oh, it's really, I am very pleased. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So we have no time for questions, so we are behind our schedule. We thank our presenters uh, for the interesting uh, presentations uh, and uh, we close uh, this session.